welcome to another edition. This is actually the second one, Vibes with Muelu. And today, <laughs> it's quite interesting, the man I have here, he is a former intern at BBC. He is a lawyer by profession and he does video and data analysis in his spare time. And I'm wondering how it will be if he was doing this as a full-time job. Scott, welcome. Oh, thank you so much, Yeah, it's good to be here. Thanks for having me. Tell us a bit about you because you just popped up from nowhere and this guy has a say in everything that has got to do with Ghanaian football. It started with Richard Kingston. He moved to Birmingham City. It was a bit of an ill-fated spell, but when he was there, he moved in actually next to me. Oh, the club put him up in a house that was next to mine. And I spent some time with his son, played football together, uh, and we also watched the 2008 AFCON together. So that was sort of how I got into it. And I think that was a that tournament was a big deal. I think it was sort of the 36th year since Ghana had won AFCON. Um, and there was a feeling that it was home. It was at home. Uh, it was a chance for Ghana to, to, to break the streak. And obviously they didn't. They got knocked out. I think they lost in the uh, semi-final. I think it's Cameroon maybe. Um, so they got knocked out. And then and then I was kind of, I was slightly hooked. And then and then obviously they, they played the World Cup. And it was it was sort of the tournament where everyone fell in love with Ghana because of how they were playing. It was Africa's World Cup and Ghana were kind of the flag bearers for Africa. And then there was the injustice of the Suarez handball. Um, certain goal, obviously, then Asimo Jean misses the penalty, we all know. So yeah, and I, I guess it was sort of, so from that, I, I was I was very, very hooked by it. I wanted to see Ghanaian fans have something to celebrate, basically. And they came so close, they kept coming so close. And 2015 AFCON being the closest. Um, uh, so that's that's been it really, and then I guess just just since then I've always been watching the players, watching the matches, um, have 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 seen the rise of the team, and, and obviously now seeing um, not quite the fall, but there's certainly been a fall from grace in the last few years. So, so yeah, I've been through it with, with all of you by choice. <laughs> okay then, so um, I mean now we know who influenced your love for Ghanaian football, obviously Olili. Yeah, he's a legend. He is a legend. But um, I understand you're a history student, yeah? So has your history yeah. in any way aligned to uh, you loving football and especially relating to Ghana? Was it African history or history in general? Yeah, so actually when I was at uni, I ended up sort of specialising more in African history. Um, I, when I went to university, I had quite an interest in sort of nation building. Sports have always played a really big role in that, basically. Um, and in fact, sports, particularly um, in kind of newer nations, of which a lot of obviously African nations are relatively speaking newer nations, uh, it's been actively kind of co-opted into that nation building process. Um, and, and, and so Ghanaian football obviously is, is a part of that. Kwame Nkrumah um, had his team who, who were who were very dominant for a short time. Uh, and since then, I think the Black Stars have been such a massive part of Ghanaian's pride uh, and Ghanaian's um, I have taken immense joy in watching them be exceptional on the world stage and I've been able to therefore kind of, I think, develop a confidence on the world stage because partly because of the, the excellence that the Black Stars have shown. Um, so yeah, that's that's part of an interest of it, uh, part of the reason for my interest, I should say. And, and maybe one could suggest that some of the issues with Ghanaian football are because it's become less about that nation building sense and has become kind of co-opted by more selfish interests and, and more party politics. Um, so yeah, it's, it's it's definitely a big part of it. It was actually insane because I've had people come into my DM. You have this friend, he, he's always like, <laughs> gala, gala, gala. So they actually wanted a day like this for you to open up and, and probably let us know why and how you fell in love with Ghanaian football. Back to the excellence of Black Stars dating back to 1957, thereabouts and all that. Regarding the recent AFCON, Ghana hasn't really been the best that we know Ghana to be. Two Afghans has been very, very, very shambolic. Did you see that coming, um, especially with the just ended one? Unfortunately, yes. Um, I was sort of going into the tournament, statistically speaking, Ghana were distinctly average and actually below average in a lot of areas that you would typically look for um, to see a team being pretty dominant coming into an AFCON. Um, the teams that typically do well at AFCONs are good at creating chances, they're good at preventing chances. They have a kind of a relatively cohesive identity. Um, Ghana were poor at creating chances, Ghana were poor at preventing chances, and Ghana had no identity. So it, it was one of those situations where it, if they could have pulled something together in sort of three weeks, almost kind of 
fluked upon some kind of cohesion and some sort of settled identity, then then they might have been able to to do well because the talent is clearly there. I mean, so you can talk about Nigeria, who, who completely changed their style um, in the tournament, and and it worked partly because of the talent in that team. But Ghana weren't able to do that. Um, they were still very disjointed. They were overly conservative. It felt like they were playing very scared. Uh, their pressing was disorganised. There, there was no clear attacking approach other than like a massive over reliance on players dribbling. And that ultimately was just a continuation of what they've been doing under Chris Hewson, essentially since he arrived. It was a, a real shame because it was a big step back from what they were doing at Ottawa, where it felt like there was some growth um, and it felt like there was a, a, a more easy identity developing. So, yes, unfortunately, I, I did see it, see it coming. Um, and they're going to need to get away from that and I think start being more proactive moving forward. So as a follow-up to that, you know it's quite embarrassing because the kind of blasters that we know is, is the blasters that you know they show up and show up in style. But because of that, we have top journalists in Ghana who started this Save Ghana Football demonstration. Mm. Do you see that as a way to go? Yeah, definitely. I think the people at the top of the FA need to start realising that they have to be accountable to someone. I think they have, broadly speaking, felt like they were immune from external pressure, um, essentially because FIFA kind of guarantees the sanctity of Football Association. Um, assuming that the Football Association leadership are, are elected or appointed on their, a lot, you know, constitutionally, FIFA essentially guarantee their security to, to behave more or less as they wish, um, making it difficult for it, sort of political interference and so on. But I think that it's very, very important that those officials understand that they, there is someone who they have to be accountable to and to some extent that they are civil servants and so the fact that the Ghanaian sort of populace led by the media are making noise and demonstrating that they are unhappy but also showing I think specific areas that they would like to see improvements it's not simply things are bad make it better but they're specifically making points about areas that they would like to see improvements in and I think that's important I think it ultimately will apply political pressure because clearly Ministry of Youth and Sport, it's an election coming up. Generally, they will be feeling the pressure that this is happening under us and we are being tarnished with the failures of not just, obviously, they are also the Ministry of Youth and Sport's failures. Let's not be around the bush. It's not a GFA issue alone, but they will be being worried about that as well. So I think by creating uh, more noise and actually by, by creating more targeted noise by that uh, concern, that pressure coming from a place where there is definitely more knowledge and, and more precision in, in terms of where people want to see improvements. I think that is really, really important. Um, and it remains to be seen if, if things do improve, but I think ultimately that, that pressure can have a positive effect um, if it makes the people in power believe that actually they, they need to be accountable, they may not retain power. One thing I'd, I'd, I'd say about you is your understanding of the game, especially Ghanaian football. It cuts across every angle to just made mention of election coming up. How to relate them to the current happenings in the Ghana football. I think you, you're, you're a great guy. So um, away from Blasters, you have in-depth knowledge about the other uh, national teams as well, taking into consideration the women's national team. They played uh, a qualifier, the Olympics qualifier, yeah, and they lost to Zambia. But prior to that, I think you saw everything that went on regarding their, 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 their bonuses that weren't paid and all that. Do you think that it had an effect on that game? Yeah, I think it's likely to have done. I think any anyone, if you put yourself in, in their shoes, um, $7,500, which is what they're expecting, is not a small amount of money. Um, they were supposed to be preparing for a massive game against a very high caliber opponent. And yet there was this distraction of the fact that they haven't been paid what was owed to them. Um, we would all struggle to work in that situation, I think. We would struggle to concentrate. We wouldn't be feeling like we were in the right mindset to go out and, and perform for our nation. And I think ultimately that's what national team sport is about. It's, it's about feeling that national pride, feeling that kind of broader, wider support from everyone. And that's how you kind of channel into positive performances, as we saw with the Ivory Coast at AFCON. And the Black Queens just can't have been feeling that. It, it, they will have felt, I think, essentially completely ignored. They will have felt dismissed, I would imagine. Uh, and then there were some obviously very unfortunate comments um, from uh, Dr. Gifty Oware as well um, in respect of, of the Black Queens. And I think hearing that from another woman will not have been 
remotely positive either. So yeah, I, I think it's likely that it will have had a negative effect on them. Um, and hopefully it, it doesn't ultimately be kind of a decided factor in them failing to qualify for the Olympics. But um, it, it's just another example of how the Football Association, the Ministry of Youth and Sport, continue to create unnecessary barriers to the success of the teams that are supposed to be representing Ghana. Yeah. Um, because it was simply just not something that should be happening. Away from that, the Ghana Premier League, how do you see our league? Is it attractive enough? I think, to be fair, there's been an improvement in the last couple of seasons, which is to be um, to be expected given the issues that had occurred a couple of years ago, the league having to be cancelled, um, and then the lack of certainty around the league, meaning that you know, it's difficult for clubs to conscientiously recruit players. Um, there have been obviously issues with finance, etc. So it's only natural the league would be improving as kind of stability returns. Um, I think teams are being a little bit more intelligent. I think the league is getting younger. Um, teams are being more conscious that they need to look to be selling players essentially and, and, and profiting on the transfer market. Um, but the standard is still fairly low and it's that's no surprise. Um, given a lot of players are signed from Ghana when they are young, there's a lot of players in Ghana, there's a lot of teams in Ghana and a lot of the teams at the top are benefiting from that sort of high caliber talent that's being developed elsewhere that they don't those players never reach the Ghana Premier League in fact when you look at kind of the top Ghanaian players who are playing abroad very very few of them ever played in the Ghana Premier League and that's I think it's still happening um and and look the GFA aren't developing coaches as well as they should have been um in the last few years they only recently I think instituted the B license course again um I don't think there's been an A license course for a while so it's only natural that the tactical and technical level would be lower than what you would like. But I think it's going to take a little while for those things to, to, to carry through. But there's still real talent there. If I was running the scouting for the GFA for the national teams, I would find it very difficult to say we're going to dedicate a huge amounts of time and resources to Ghana Premier League. Because there might be one or two players in that in that in that league that may or may that may be Black Stars quality. But the fact is, it's so difficult to find those one or two players with the current information we have, that I'd be much, much more efficient looking elsewhere. And I would be able to get through and scout many more players. So that's the challenge. Um, it is very, very difficult to do. Um, and I think it's going to take leadership from the GFA and indeed the, the clubs to make that a much more straightforward process because it's in their interests um, because of the, the, the importance of exporting players and, and, and generally making signings at, and profiting that way but at the moment they're just not really doing it so it's very difficult and, and whether you're scouting by data or scouting by video it's it's really really tough uh, you made mention that if you were the gfa scout there uh, it means obviously <laughs> the chance would you would you want to take up that position if you you are at any point consulted to to take up that position of being a scout or data video analyst for the Ghana Football Association because you have you have vast knowledge about Ghana football. Yeah, look, in the, in the right situation, it's something I'll be open to. I think my career is going in a slightly different direction now. Um, but it's the sort of thing that I think it, it, even if someone was was just keen to talk to someone and, and get recommendations, I'd obviously be open to that, basically. Um, I'm keen to help if someone would consider that I had something useful to tell them, which they may not. I mean, the, the truth is, is we don't know how kind of polished they are at the Ghana FA and on the coaching staff. And it may be that everything I say, they know, and then they know all these other things. Um, but they may they may consider that I have some useful inputs. And if that were the case, then of course, I'd be happy to, okay. to talk some. Great stuff. You're someone who really likes um, players coming up in the terms of development and stuff like that you catch them at a younger age. We talk about Ghana Premier League. Do you know any prospects? Long-term prospects. Um, but basically, I'd say David Aduro at Accra Lions. I think he's kind of a cheating answer to some extent because he was on he was on trial at Chelsea, I think. Um, but he's kind of the standout for me in the sense that he's he's got a really impressive physical profile and he's technically very impressive and he's 17 and he's playing a full season in the Ghana Premier League um, at that age. And that's sort of a reason why someone like a Chelsea would be interested in him because they would see those things and say, you know, this is someone we should have a look at. I think his teammate, Daniel Apple, I think he has some traits that are really valuable. And also he's 18 years old. He's tall, he's got the height that you look for. 
Abdul is his Issa at Dreams is is awesome to watch. I think he's he's another young guy who, who I guess is probably going to play for some of the Ghana national teams and get exposure that way and potentially be able to come through. And it's interesting because Ghana kind of struggle, I think, in that number 10 area a little bit. Um, he, he potentially has the potential to develop into that. Nuruddin Abdullahi, I like at Mediana, the young centre back. I think he's another one who who has shown his quality, like, and he's really got the physical the physical abilities because he's got the technical level, and the physical level. I think he has to improve defensive awareness. McCarthy Afori, who's a midfielder, and another reason that I like I like him is again because he's he's got kind of the combination of the technical and the, the physical ability. Um, he's got great height. Um, he's fairly quick. He's got a good length. And then also he's, he's kind of got good technical ability, two-footed, likes to progress the ball, good defender and can play in a few different positions. You're someone who has always been talking about building the team around young players. We have the likes of Kudus Mohamed. Kamaldin is out in Jedi's comeback and he started the game a few minutes. Uh, we can talk about Fatawi Shaku, who I think you personally mm-hmm. like would want to watch one of his games. Uh, do you think that these guys can take up the mantle? Can we, if we build the team around them, do you think that they are the right guys? If we have the, I mean, a good team to support them going forward, they, they can make something uh, very impactful for for the Black Stars. Yeah, definitely. I think they're some of the most talented players at their age in the world. They've got some very special traits. Some of those players, um, I, think, I mean, you look at Mohamed Kudus, he's, he's outstanding. I think Atara Sahak has obviously shown really good growth this season at Leicester. Um, I think has matured. I think there's obviously still some way to go for him, but there's been some really positive signs. Um, I think Ernest Muama has been really excited. There's, there's, there's so many of these guys, and I think there are there, there are others who, who we can perhaps talk about later who are kind of coming through. But definitely, they have the quality, and it's really about what you said about having that the kind of a team around them. And when I think about the team around them, I'm also talking about the coaching staff, uh, the kind of the those who are doing the, the player analysis work, the scouting work, all of those things, so that there's kind of a cohesive, overall cohesive identity. Because the, the issue at the moment is, is when you look at Kudus, he is literally being asked to do everything for his team. And that's not an environment which is conducive to Ghana being successful. They need to be have, have more players doing more and, and be a much more cohesive unit and to kind of bring out the best of everyone. But I genuinely think if they, if they do do that, then some of the young guys that they've got coming through can definitely lead Ghana to success and, and kind of break the, the long AFCON streak um, without winning. And also, you know, impress a, impress a World Cups because obviously 2026 is an expanded World Cup now. It's easier to qualify. Obviously, Ghana are going to have to get through Mali um, to get there, but it's easier to qualify. I think this sort of generation that have come through with some really exciting prospects who if the pieces around them and the structures around them are in place, Ghana can have success. Let's do a bit of social media now. Now, my own brother, Kojo Heming, he says that, how difficult is it to sort through the statistical noise and filter through the video and the league player quality when determining the best players in the GPL? Yeah, so I think, as we sort of talked about earlier, it's very, very hard to do. Um, the way in which you would sort it over time is 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 by having bigger bigger sample sizes to improve your certainty in terms of what a player is producing statistically and that that was more repeatable and more consistent um, and it wasn't being kind of significantly influenced by a game here or a game there um, which which for a GPL player could take considerably longer than for players in other leagues where you're getting more access to the data and then the same with the videos. You're trying to use video to kind of step through that and understand why the, st- the statistics look as they do, trying to assess that how that works. But without the volume of video that you might get for other leagues, it's still that same issue in terms of time. Um, so it's fundamentally difficult. And it's the fact that you're going to be therefore dealing with quite a significant degree of uncertainty or a more significant degree of uncertainty than you might have when looking at players in other leagues. In multiple reports, it has been said that Coach Botuado is leading the race for a return. Do you think that his comeback would, would be something a bit different from what he's done before? Um, I, I feel like he'd probably take a similar approach to what he did when he was in the job before. But I think that's probably relatively positive news. Um, certainly at, at a kind of an African level, at a continental level, he showed a certain proactiveness that I think Ghana 
would be well served in utilising. Um, I think he was willing to try young players, which was which was positive. It was clear that he was thinking about in a system. I want this particular skill set at this position against this opponent because this is what I think we need. And I think he was definitely willing to do that at a continental level. And I think at the World Cup he did get quite conservative. And I, my concern would be that he would, as soon as he got to an Afcon like that, might happen again. He would be quite kind of proactive and positive outside of tournaments, and then get to an Afcon and then become very conservative again. But I think that's where you probably need people around him and him to build that confidence that he just didn't get a chance to do um, in his first spell. So I, I don't think it would be the worst thing in the world.